Today we are joined by Mrs. Gladwell Ochiano. Welcome. You're the former head of the Transparency International, Kenya, and now executive director of the Africa Center for Open Governance, known as AFRICOG. So welcome to Women in Charge. Thank you very much. And tell us who you are. Introduce yourself. Well, uh, as you've said, my name is Gladwell, Gladwell Ochiano. I'm from Kenya. And uh, I live in Kenya and work there uh, with, a, with an organization that uh, focuses on uh, anti-corruption and, uh, and governance issues. Okay, and talk to us a little bit about AFRICOG's uh, objectives, your goals. Okay, AFRICOG's main uh, goal is um, to, to empower citizens to be able to hold a government to account. And that's based on the recognition that uh, it doesn't matter whether a government is doing well or doing poorly. Uh, uh, they, governments must always be held uh, to account. They must always be scrutinized. Uh, so what we're trying to do is create a, a culture of what we call permanent civic vigilance uh, so that whether a government is doing well or whether it's doing poorly you're, you're, uh, you're holding it to account and you have the knowledge and the wherewithal to hold it to account. Okay, and you're here with us in Senegal today. Tell us about the purpose of your visit. Yes, I've been invited to speak uh, at uh, this meeting uh, um, on uh, civil society and uh, governance assessments. Uh, based on my experience and, and the work I do. So I've come to listen and learn and also to contribute. Okay, and why is it so important to have a forum such as this one on governance assessments? I think it's uh, Im always important to, to have an op opportunity to, to sort of learn what's going on, what are others doing, um, what's the state of the art in, in the sector, what's the state of the art as far as this particular uh, aspect is concerned, uh, civil society uh, and governance assessments. So uh, it's basically uh, important to keep each other up to date and also perhaps agree on future actions, meet people, network, etc. Right. And your organization, AFRICOG, it targets itself on tackling issues of corruption. Uh, some might think that's a bit of a bold move. Well, uh, it, it is, it, it can be and it often has been, <laughs> uh, uh, personally and as an organization, uh, because you're actually uh, looking at what are uh, crimes. Uh, corruption is a crime and therefore, and, and, and it's a crime that's extremely lucrative. People earn hundreds of millions of dollars doing it. Uh, and so uh, it can, you can make some very powerful people quite upset. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Tell us about um, corruption and what forms of corruption exist. In general, well, um, corruption is very simply has been defined as the abuse of public power or the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. So, and, and it takes as many forms as the human imagination <laughs> can invent. And unfortunately, people are very inventive about ways of uh, basically abusing power in order to... to, to to uh, profit uh, personally. And in Africa, our problem is that uh, politics and, uh, and, and the state have often uh, functioned as the shortest ladder to, to enormous uh, wealth. So, so politics is, is seen as a way to make a lot of money. And because a lot of our systems are very weak, the controls aren't always there. There are a lot of loopholes. Um, politics is often, you know, used by people who are merely interested in getting into power so they can make a lot of money. So we have uh, huge problems of corruption, uh, ranging from corruption at the petty level, the policeman taking a bribe on the street to not arrest you for whatever it is. Yeah. Or, um, or the businessman who offer a government official money so that he can get a contract. Or um, the criminal, you know, uh, uh, the sort of organized criminal, uh, mafia type of, of corruption where people who are engaging in drug smuggling, human trafficking, arms smuggling, all that uh, will capture officials in order to be able to do their business without being held to account. And basically the capture of a state or the capture of policy so that... Uh, when, when rules are being made, they're going to function in your interest. So it's a whole range of, um, of things which can happen from the lowest to the highest. And a lot of times it'll work together. You know, there's the saying that a fish rots from the head. So uh, it can become systemic. So an entire country can be, you know, systemically. 
exactly. Else, As you say, if it rots from the head, yeah. you think that the changes have to be made at the higher level yeah. to trickle down to the lower level. Yeah. Okay. How does Kenya fare with other African countries? Well, Kenya has um, for a long time been near or near the bottom of many sort of assessments of, uh, of, of corruption. But obviously there are other countries which, um, which have less international attention in terms of uh, being attractive as a destination for foreign investment, which sort of fall off the radar, which are a lot more corrupt. But still, Kenya doesn't have a, a good reputation as far as corruption is concerned. Yeah. Tell us about democracy or lack thereof in Kenya. Yes, well, uh, if you remember in, um, the, in the year 2000, December, we had an election. And uh, because the presidential election was seen as having been um, flawed, uh, as basically uh, people felt that the vote was stolen, uh, at least many people, obviously the other side didn't. <laughs> um, it was followed by a, a crisis where, you know, uh, um, there was wide-scale wide violence. Uh, many people were killed, over 1,300. Many, many people were displaced, hundreds of thousands. Uh, so there was a collapse and it was indeed necessary for, uh, for there to be international intervention for a resolution to the crisis. So um, while on the surface of it, Kenya looks like it functions, you, you know, you look at Kenya, it's a place where, you know, the international organizations have their headquarters, people like to come there on safari. Under the surface, there are a lot of problems and uh, particularly in this case, the democracy. Uh, totally collapse and with the result that now we have uh, several Kenyans who are in front of the in International Criminal Court at The Hague for their alleged involvement in the violence. Okay. Yeah. And as you said, there tends to be, I mean you can call a country democratic, but there tends to be some gaps in the system sometimes. What do you feel could be done to lessen these gaps? Yes, I should add that uh, Kenya is just one of the countries where after having seen democracy really take hold, or so we thought, uh, around Africa, the sort of second liberation, uh, we saw then um, a whole series of contestations around elections. Uh, we had Zimbabwe, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, various countries where, uh, you know, you had your elections, but they were, the results were were contested. So uh, what are the gaps? I mean, there are huge gaps in the Kenyan case. Um, in the, there are institutional gaps uh, and a lack of trust in the institutions. So the Electoral Commission was basically seen as, uh, as you know, commissioners were appointed by the president unilaterally. So the other side didn't trust them. When the results were not accepted, there was no referee, no impartial arbiter to whom people could go and say, look, we've had a problem here. If you remember the American example where George Bush uh, uh, basically was seen as having manipulated the elections, the Supreme Court made a decision, people accepted it. In the Kenyan case, the opposition said, no, we don't trust the judiciary, it's been manipulated and stacked by the, by the people in power. So institutions were, institutional failure was one, one reason. Yeah. In 2005, you resigned from your post um, at the Transparency International. <laughs> I see you're laughing. But you had said, quote, This government is not serious about attacking corruption. Its major focus seems to be to criticise anyone who questions its commitment to fighting corruption. So since then, what has changed? Well, uh, I don't know that <laughs> very much has changed. The context at that time was that um, the government then had, had come into power, the president had come into power, as presidents so often do in Africa, on a zero tolerance to corruption platform. And he got an overwhelming mandate from the people to do something about corruption. Now, um, one of the first things they did was to appoint uh, my predecessor at Transparency International Kenya as his personal advisor on anti-corruption governance. That was 2003. Uh, two short years later, um, my predecessor, John Githongo, had to flee the country for fear of his life. Um, and uh, in the midst of a huge scandal, um, which which the current which the government was uh, clearly involved in, um, ministers going up really uh, to uh, presumably the president, who must have known uh, what was going on. So after he left, then um, then I basically had a conflict with the board of uh, 
Transparency International Kenya, who, some of whom were very close to the government. Um, and, and based on, on that conflict, I decided to resign uh, from Transparency International Kenya. So that points out another problem in, in terms of democracy in, in Africa. Is in, even civil society is uh, sort of uh, permeated with conflicts of interest. In this case, a board which was too close to government. Uh, I must say, though, that the board of TI Kenya has since changed, you know, I mean, it's, this is many years down the line. So I wouldn't say that so much has changed uh, since then. In fact, the fact that the country uh, descended into open conflict in um, 2008 uh, was an expression of the fact that nothing had changed and that for decades we haven't addressed the underlying problems of politics and democracy and equality and ethnicity, etc. And you say like your colleague had to flee. Is there, has there ever been a point in your life when you've felt fear for your own life or your family? Yes, I think um, um, in this line of work, uh, you often don't realize that you're seen as, as a threat. Because some, I, I think that uh, often people who work in civil society don't actually realize the, the power that they have. Because you're so uh, involved in your own struggle that you don't realize that other people uh, see you, see the potential that you have and, uh, and see that as a threat. So uh, particularly in 2008, uh, several of us in civil society did land on lists of uh, people who were threatened with death because uh, they were seen as betraying whichever cause people happened to believe in. And also we had to, um, we had to protect people who were under threat, we had to hide them, we had to get them out of the country. So obviously when you're involved in doing things like that, which are very clandestine, you know, including, you know, you're, you're shipping people across borders, you, you know, uh, so you, you feel your phone is being tapped, etc. So you, you do at some moments feel fear, although I would say that um, I personally feel that uh, somebody who is more uh, at the grassroots, doesn't have the international connections that I have, etc., is much more threatened. So that's always something, whenever I'm feeling afraid, I'm thinking, well, if you're afraid, what do you think exactly. is happening with someone who doesn't have the networks and the influence yeah. and the resources that you do? And you've never wanted to stop what you do? Has it just made you want to push yourself? Um, I, don't, I don't know whether I would have wanted to stop. Um, but, you know, I remember in 2008 when we were under threat and we all got together and said, look, um, we don't want to be martyrs. Because exactly. <laughs> if, if we're not there anymore, then the work isn't being done. So um, I think you have to be able to gauge a situation. Um, uh, and, uh, but but uh, no, I've never wanted to stop what I was doing. It's what I've done most of my life, whether I was being paid or not. So. <laughs> Yeah. Talking about the media, do you feel there's more that the media could do in order to raise awareness, advocacy and to change people's attitudes? Yeah, well, in, um, particularly in Kenya, but I think in Africa in general, I mean, the Kenyan media is relatively advanced. In terms of what's on the continent, I would say that we're among the top three countries, perhaps maybe top four. Um, so I think the, the media does a lot, especially in terms of exposing issues. Civil society doesn't always have the capacity to, to unearth information as much as the media does. Um, but what I find is that the media, uh, A, because it's commercially driven, and B, it's also like most other um, institutions in, in our country and in Africa where, you know, they're politically aligned. So um, they don't always, um, they may highlight an issue, but they don't stick with it. And they don't unearth the sort of underlying uh, causes and structures. So as civil society, we, we do that. You know, we, we can focus on an issue for years. Uh, and so um, we, we, we are working, like AFRICOG is working with the media on an investigative journalism project to strengthen the capacity, because there's also issues of capacity, you know, um, in terms of just the technical skills. So we're strength, trying to strengthen the capacity of journalists and the media to focus on issues. And then there are issues which may be suppressed by the mainstream media, which we'd like to see highlighted. 
And, uh, and so we've worked on that. Amongst other things, we, we did a, um, an investigative project on corruption in the media, <laughs> which, <laughs> which obviously the media isn't going to really exactly go delve into. Yeah. Into, yeah. 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 And how about um, other challenges you might face, maybe any financial drawbacks? Well, financially, yes. I mean, th those are always there, but I personally never proceed from the assumption that um, money is an issue. I, I proceed from the assumption that if you, if, you're, if you have good ideas, the money will come sooner or later. So, um, and I think we've been able to, to uh, do the work we do. We've not really, I mean, we obviously could do a whole lot better if we had, uh, if we had more money. And I think the, the funding practices of the donors don't help. And they've actually not seemed to learn from past experiences and improve the way that they fund so they uh, improve our capacity to work. Uh, as you know, most uh, civil society organizations, at least in our country and many others, are dependent on foreign financing, which is a challenge because then people say, well, who are you speaking for? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, many of our governments are also getting a lot of money from <laughs> foreign governments, so you know, who are they speaking for? But yeah, uh, I mean, there are many challenges, capacity, over the decades, uh, investment in social, social investment has gone down, so education has suffered, so um, the sort of um, pool of human capital that you're drawing from, you've got to do a lot of work to build up its capacity. And Kenya's doing relatively well on that, on that um, level, so if we're suffering, then you know, other co African countries are probably uh, suffering a lot. So a lot of, a lot of challenges, but it's, it's really exciting work. Um, you know, when I visit places like Europe, etc., I don't think they, they're dealing with as critical questions as we are. Obviously they are, but because their societies are so much more settled and they're not risking their lives largely unless they're in the newer European countries or the ex-Soviet Union. So um, I think it's challenging, but it's really critical work. What made you want to follow this path? Did you always hear yourself fulfilling this role? Well, when I look back, I remember in, um, in high school when they asked you your career <laughs> sort of path, and it was pretty much, I mean, at the time, they, they didn't have NGOs as such, but I did see myself working in the sphere of, of uh, of trying to make things better, trying to understand things better. So in that sense, I don't think um, that I've wavered from that path. Although, you know, obviously, um, sometimes accidents will play a role, like you happen to be in a particular place at a particular time. But the general path, I think, uh, also, I think it's also a question of people's personalities. And I think you'll find uh, a lot of similar personalities in this kind of work. <laughs> And um, personally, again, what's been the most challenging or memorable moment of your life so far? Um, <laughs> well, on a personal level, I think I've been faced with quite a few challenges. Um, I, do, I wouldn't reduce it to one moment uh, or the most memorable moment. Hmm. Uh, too many? Too many, actually. <laughs> a whole series of very, very challenging uh, moments. Yeah. For the challenges, are you satisfied with where Africa stands at the moment? Mm, well, I'm the sort of person who's never satisfied and that's probably also a civil society trait. You always want better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, I think we've done a lot in a relatively short time. But now uh, we could be poised to, to grow and to reach out more to people. Because I think one of the challenges is always how do you actually impact on the people who you claim to be working for. So I would really like to see us doing a whole lot more spreading out over the country and just sort of upping our game and the country's game in terms of um, issues of transparency, accountability. I mean, Kenya has huge potential. Uh, if you listen to some of the, the innovations, uh, for example, in technology, and uh, you know, increasing access to information, etc. A lot of it is being done in Kenya, and I'd like to see a situation where you can, at the click of a button, get all sorts of information about what government is doing, etc. So I would really like us to to contribute to to reaching where we we actually have the potential to reach. Yeah. Has being a woman ever stopped you from uh, reaching your goal, or? Has has it made things harder for you? Uh, I think 
it probably has, but my family, in my family, that was never a question. Uh, my mother was a very, very powerful political activist uh, in the freedom struggle and uh, in the struggle for democracy. My father was very progressive, so we never had a, an issue about, you know, woman or man. But in the broader society, obviously, you have to struggle a lot more for recognition. Um, as a woman and as an African woman, a black woman, having lived in Europe, that was also a huge struggle, uh, being, you know, achieving a level of recognition and yeah, working at the level where you should be working. So it's, it's, I've, I've not seen it as a hindrance because I wasn't brought up to see it that way. But obviously it's been one that I've had to struggle against. And tell us about balancing a career and your family life. It is so hard. <laughs> it's like as I sit here, I've got my kids at home, <laughs> you know, wondering are they going to school, are they doing their homework. I think you can never, the lesson I've learned is you, you can never do both simultaneously. You have to focus on them sort of alternately, at least that's what I've learned. But one thing, I mean, living in Africa, you've got your social network, you've got, you can afford household help. <laughs> so you're, you're doing a lot better than, let's say, um, if you're in Europe, but it's a, it's a massive struggle. <laughs> yeah. Any tips, any? Any tips? Well, you know, your kids basically know, <laughs> you know, they, they, they know when you're, that you're trying and mm -hmm. I, you don't have to be there every minute. People talk about quality time, I don't know. But, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think there are no recipes. I think it's just uh, being as open and honest and trying as hard as you can, uh, you know to do your best on all those fronts and, and recognizing that you're not a superhuman being. Uh, there, you, there are times when you're not going to do so well on this front and not so well on the other. But Lastly, do you feel that with regard to Africa, we will ever completely achieve good governance and by that being honest and law-abiding? This is the million dollar question. <laughs> um, we obviously have a long way to go, a long way to go. Uh, I, you know, this, I wouldn't be doing this work if I didn't believe that, that we can get there, but um, that we can do a whole lot better uh, than we're doing. And, uh, you know, you would like to, to see Africa being recognized for the good things that it does and the important contributions it makes. And, and what people don't really recognize is this, the way that the normal people in Africa struggle so hard. You know, right now you've got the Europeans going through all sorts of crises because of, you know, whatever problems they have. Africans are dealing with those problems every day and they don't, ex and much worse, you know, and they don't expect anybody else to help them. And uh, so when you talk about an international crisis, people, you know, like as an African, I'm like, what crisis? This is our normal life <laughs> and we deal with it. So, you know, so I would like that sort of resilience uh, and the generosity uh, that we have in the middle of all of the travails and the struggles. Uh, Africans are immensely generous people and they're not just giving to their own families. They're just basically contributing and keeping each other going in the absence of systems that function. They have their own systems that function. So I think all of that needs to some, if we could find a way to make that recognize, then I think people would stop looking at us as a place where it's just, you know, catastrophe and chaos. And I mean, I'm sure even in a country like Somalia, which they say is collapsed, there are fantastic things working there. I mean, people are doing massive things on the basis of trust there. I mean, for example, their, their system of transmitting money is much more sophisticated and costs a lot less than Western Union. <laughs> and the money gets where it's going because they have trust. Yeah. So all of those sort of um, things which are not recognized, uh, perhaps because we Africans aren't turning it into governance assessments, <laughs> you know, those are the sort of things we need to inject into into sort of the international discourse and and then maybe one day i mean as far as not just the way people look at us but as, as far as the way we perform for our own people in terms of their health uh, education etc that we one day will be able to do a whole lot more than than we're doing now yeah yeah thank you very much mrs gladwell acheno for being our guest on women in charge thank you very much for inviting me <laughs>